Hey students, welcome back. Today we're going to get into chapter 24 and we're going to talk about the early civil rights movement beginning in the 1950s. We're also going to talk a little bit just about the 1950s generally, culturally, what's happening in the United States. Um, and then we're going to end today with the presidential election of John F. Kennedy. So as you can see, we're going to talk again generally about the 1950s. That's going to be the beginning. Then we're going to talk about this Red Scare that takes place in the 1950s, this fear of communism, which is sometimes referred to in its 1950s incarnation as McCarthyism, and we'll talk about why that is. And then we're going to talk about several examples of early civil rights actions um, that were successful, and then the election of 1960. Okay, so just some things generally about the 1950s when we're talking about U.S. culture. And I'm just going to go through these points one by one, um, beginning with this culture of fear and conformity. This is very much based in this Cold War mentality and this post-war era of American history, right? You've just had the United States come through two major wars, World War II and also the Korean War. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the general um, from World War II, will be elected president in 1952, and he will take office in 1953 and essentially stay in office, win a second term and stay in office and leave in 1961. And throughout the 1950s, you really have this sense of just wanting to have um, security in the country. There's obviously this threat of nuclear war kind of hanging over everybody's head. And people are often being reminded of this. They're duck and cover drills and all of that. So that has a lot to do with that culture of fear and conformity. But again, this Cold War environment, this fear of communism. And that's actually related to the second point, the religion. We see in the 1950s, um, really sort of this effort made actually on an institutional level to try to inject religion into American culture. And this was really seen as a way to distinguish the United States from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was seen as a godless society by a lot of anti-communists. And so, for example, the Eisenhower administration um, orders that the Treasury Department orders that all money have the words in God we trust printed on it um, beginning in the 1950s moving forward. Now there had been coins um, prior to the 1950s that had that stamped into the coin, but it was not something that was put on all money until the 1950s. Um, another part is the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, this idea of, of one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Again, those types of words were added in order to distinguish the United States as a God-fearing society compared to the godless uh, communists. The other thing that's happening is this massive baby boom, right? Um, and people are having babies. Of course, this creates the baby boomer generation in this post-war years. And because of the affluence of American society at this time, in large part because of the GI Bill, a lot of these uh, returning war vets were able to take advantage of the GI Bill, which was passed by Congress in 1944, which basically allowed for veterans to have access to really low interest uh, mortgages and also um, free education. And so a, a lot of people took advantage of those low interest mortgage, mortgages when they returned from the war and they went and they bought homes in suburbia, which was a desirable place to raise children. It was seen as safer than the cities, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so we get this big suburban boom as well, particularly here in California, where a lot of people had moved during World War II. You're going to get this suburban sprawl being um, built up around Los Angeles and the surrounding areas, um, San Diego as well. Women in the 1950s, again, within this culture of conformity, um, were really sort of uh, put in a position of, of 
of conforming to these very domestic roles, these domestic spheres. Um, although women had gone into the workforce in large numbers um, during World War II, after the war, again, because of this relative affluence of society, in other words, people were making money, the middle class was growing, a lot of women then did retreat back into um, the home and, you know, stayed home and became housewives, homemakers, had children, um, and raised their children from the home. And, and this was also possible, right, because you could have one a person going out into the world and making enough money to support a family. We also see in the 1950s some growing um, tensions on the international scale. Of course, we had the Korean War, um, you know, but then we also have these growing tensions in Vietnam. Uh, what happens in Vietnam is after World War II, the Vietnamese, uh, they rise up against the col their um, colonizers, who are the French, and um, there's this big sort of a, a, like a civil war, really, that takes place uh, within Vietnam. And eventually, Vietnam is going to be split um, along the 17th parallel between North Vietnam and South Vietnam very similar to what happens um, in Korea. Um, but here it's um, the French colonizers that are um, eventually forced to leave what was once Indochina. This is going to create political instability in this region, and eventually this is gonna to lead to a major conflict, um, a Cold War proxy war that the United States is gonna get very much involved in. And then uh, finally, um, even though the United States was very much a culture of fear and conformity in the 1950s, there was an emerging counterculture um, known as the Beats or sometimes referred to as the Beatniks. And these are young people typically um, in uh, uh, urban environments who are questioning um, this culture of fear and conformity. Um, they're, they're making music, folk music, um, they're creating literary works, and so we do have this emerging counterculture which will eventually morph into what we think of as the counterculture movement of the 1960s, the hippies, etc. Um, but we see that emerging in the 1950s, it's a very small um, group. Um, but it will grow considerably as the uh, baby boomer generation grows up. They are going to adopt a lot of these counterculture ideas. Okay, so this is a map that is showing us where uh, major population growth happened as a result of World War II, so defense industry and wartime jobs brought a lot of people to this area of the country that is generally known as the Sun Belt. Why is it called the Sun Belt? Well, because we got a lot of sunny skies. And um, this, of course, uh, will require that these areas create new infrastructure in order to accommodate the growing populations. So I already talked about the suburban sprawl, right? This becomes a major feature in a lot of these places where you see large population growth. Um, you'll notice here in California, Los Angeles and San Diego were two of these major, what were considered sunbelt cities where people were moving in large numbers for these wartime jobs. The other thing that's happening culturally in the U.S. at this time period is the introduction of the television. Um, the television was introduced in the 1940s, but very few people could afford to have one, and they weren't very practical. But over time, they got larger and they got more practical. And you can see here in this image, you've got um, this television that's kind of also got a radio and a, and a turntable for playing <laughs> records. And so it's kind of an all around um, entertainment center. And you'll notice that the screen itself is not very large. Um, but by the time we get to the mid 1950s, 
um, there's going to be about half of all U.S. households that have a television. And soon what we're going to see is a transition by the time we get to the 1960s of people getting their information primarily from television instead of print and radio. Um, and this is a major transformation in the way in which messaging and information is conveyed. Obviously, this is a very visual medium, the television. And of course, advertisers were able to um, really take advantage of this uh, medium, right? Um, you know, advertisements, of course, had always been in the print materials and also over the radio. Um, but now they've got this new, you know, uh, method to get their, their products out there, and that's the television. This is also going to be important in um, bringing together a element of popular culture as well as, of course, um, t television shows will be syndicated across the country. And so people are watching the same kind of television shows, similar to what was happening with radio um, prior, you know, where people across the country would listen to the same radio show. So it does um, strengthen those bonds in terms of and um, national culture, uh, popular culture. Okay, so here we go. As I mentioned, um, suburban sprawl and suburban development, you get these track homes that were being built um, across um, areas where populations had grown considerably during World War II. And these are big housing developments, a lot of which had affordable homes. And of course, if you were taking advantage of that GI Bill, it was even more accessible to you. And these were desirable places to live. They were seen as safer, as I mentioned, than the inner cities. Um, they typically had grocery stores and, and um, schools nearby. So this becomes a very popular uh, place for a lot of this population growth um, that we see in the post-war years. Um, I also, I guess, wanted to add one more thing to this is, and that's that there's also an element of isolation here. Um, and that's because a lot of these families that are living in these suburban areas were displaced from extended families because they moved for a wartime job industry and then they stayed there. So their extended family might live in the Midwest or might live, you know, in the East. If you move to California, for example, you might, you know, have family that still lives in the Midwest or on the East Coast. And so there's this new sort of um, type of culture that emerges where you're you're not so much with your family necessarily, but you're kind of isolating more in these family units. Um, there were new um, innovations in the 1950s, similar to the 1920s, um, coming out for um, kitchens and uh, appliances and that type of thing. So we're gonna see advancements there. Um, and of course, here we see an image of a very typical sort of 1950s housewife. She's wearing the apron and the dress and the heels and, um, you know, she's in the kitchen. Um, so we see this, this sort of, again, um, I want to say a stereotype, a female stereotype that emerges in the 1950s and is celebrated in um, popular culture as well in the 1950s on television shows and in movies. Okay, and this point actually goes back to my original point that I was talking about on, um, when I talked about the suburban sprawl is here we get a real focus again as we get, move into these suburban communities on the nuclear family. And this also speaks to this idea of fear and conformity. Um, you have a bit of an isolationist kind of mentality in these post-war years in the United States and entertainment in the home, right? Um, cookouts and barbecues become uh, very popular and family becomes the primary focus of that entertainment, whether that be in the television, uh, whether that be, again, just staying at home with 
the nuclear family. Now, when I say nuclear family, I don't mean like nuclear, like atomic family. What I mean is like you have a, a, a husband and a wife and you've got, you know, two kids and a dog kind of thing, you know, like a little family. Um, and again, this, this sense of displacement for a lot of families because of movements and migrations during the wartime years. That's always an element of this as well. Okay, so um, this is a video that I show um, to demonstrate the ways in which the fear of communism played out in society in the 1950s. Um, if you click on this link, and please do, what you are going to see is a, a, a clip from an armed forces training video. Um, so this would have been shown to soldiers who are being trained. And it is literally titled, How to Spot a Communist. And you'll notice as you're watching the video that there are very sort of particular characteristics that the government is saying that communists have. Right, that they are, that they tend to speak out against um, the government, that they tend to protest, that they tend to be anti-imperialist, and um, and as you get, you know, through, and it's a very quick video, um, but I think you get a real sense that um, this idea that you, that there is this conformity that is expected and desired in the 1950s. You really get a sense of that from, from this video because you get a sense that you don't want to be somebody that stands out, um, that speaks up against things because you may be viewed as a communist. Um, so please click on this link, check this video out. Um, Okay, so here we go to talking about uh, McCarthyism. Then again, you know, it's again this idea of a fear of communism. So a congressional committee was formed um, in the House of Representatives called the House on Un-American Activities Committee. Um, it was formed in 1938, actually. So this was towards the... Um, you know, World War II had not even broke out yet. Um, but again, it was speaking to this fear of communists and communism and the threat of communism. And it actually lasted until 1975. The House on Un-American Activities Committee investigated ordinary citizens. In other words, if you were somebody that was suspected of having ties to communism or socialism or any kind of political radicalism, you could potentially be called in front of this committee and interrogated. There was a very famous group of people that were called in front of the House on Un-American Activities Committee in the 1950s, and they were called the Hollywood Ten. And the Hollywood Ten was a group of screenwriters and directors and producers from Hollywood that were called to Washington, D.C. to testify in front of this congressional committee on whether or not they were communist sympathizers. And they refused to answer the questions that were presented to them. And they actually ended up um, getting a contempt of court and they ended up getting fined. Some of them ended up getting jailed. And many of them got blacklisted, meaning that they were unable to get jobs in their industry um, for, the, for the rest of their lives. Um, and so this was very damaging and could be very damaging to people if they got called in front of these congressional committees. Um, who you see pictured there is Senator Joseph McCarthy. He was a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, and he gets it in his mind in the 1950s that, there, that the U.S. government itself had been infiltrated by communists, and particularly the State Department. And he um, carries out a series of hearings in the Senate on um, where he's bringing up members of the State Department and accusing them of being communist. It, come, it becomes very clear over the course of these very publicized hearings, they were even broadcast on television, that 
he's he's mentally unstable, right? He he begins to just accuse everybody of having communist ties. So this idea of a red scare in communist hysteria, that is kind of synonymous with this term McCarthyism. Okay, so, but again, this is not a joke because it really did impact some people's lives. Um, people lost their jobs over this. Um, and um, people, again, were blacklisted and not able to get jobs in the areas in which they were skilled and they had worked previously. Um, so if you click on this video, we'll talk more in depth about this era and particularly about the fear of communism and the consequences that it had for a lot of people's lives um, in the 1950s and even a little bit into the 1960s as well. All right, so now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about the early civil rights movement in the 1950s. So keep in mind that in World War II, the United States military was the most diverse it had ever been. You had African-Americans serving in record numbers, Latinos serving in record numbers, Asians, Native Americans, and all of those groups, when they returned back to the United States, face discrimination in one way or another. And as I mentioned, the double V campaign that, you know, that was created during World War II um, to address the fact that, yeah, there are these problems in the United States and we need to address those problems as we go and fight discrimination and intolerance abroad. So you have a growing group of activists who are going to be uh, wanting to address the issue of housing discrimination, of employment discrimination, of segregation, right? Which of course is still um, alive and well in a lot of parts of the United States. So there was a, there was a growing discontent. Um, and then you start to see these activist networks, right? Beginning, uh, uh, with you know you have the civil rights um, the civil rights organization that was created during World War II, um, but you also have this Cold War that's happening, and within the context of the Cold War, the United States was starting to look really bad when it came to its record on uh, discrimination, racial discrimination, and. Uh, there were a lot of communist groups and socialist groups and um, groups like that that were criticizing the way that the United States treated their minorities. And the government becomes acutely aware of this as time goes on. And so there's actually pressure um, either directly or indirectly being placed on the United States and its institutions from these international communist and socialist organizations that are very publicly criticizing the fact that discrimination is alive and well throughout the United States in this post-war era. So the combination of having, you know, veterans coming home to discriminatory environments growing activist networks, and then international pressure, all of those things combine lead to a very growing, robust, and eventually successful, albeit slowly, civil rights movement. So in order to lay the foundation for talking about the civil rights movement moving forward, I want to acknowledge the fact that the civil rights movement was a highly organized movement. And a lot of this organization actually took place at a specific area um, called the Highlander Folk School. Um, this folk school was located in Tennessee. And in the 1930s, it was actually established as a place to train labor activists. But by the time we get to the 1950s in the post-war era, it, changed, it switches its focus to be on training civil rights activists. 
Now you might say to yourself, well, what kind of training do you need in order to be an activist? Well, keep in mind that the, the very popularized act, um, civil rights action movements that were led by people like Martin Luther King were nonviolent. And in order to be a nonviolent um, activist, you have to have a certain skill set in which you're willing to put up with serious aggression being committed against you. So that if you wanted to go out and commit an act of civil disobedience in a peaceful way, which is every American's constitutional right under the First Amendment of the Constitution, um, those activists needed to be prepared for potential police brutality. You know, back in, in these days, if you got out and you protested something, you were going to be met with police in riot gear, with billy clubs, um, with gas, um, you know, uh, all types of um, things, dogs, um, fire hoses. Um, these were all methods that were used to try to stop these acts of civil disobedience during the civil rights movement. And so these activists would train, they would get together um, um, to organize, right, just to plan a, an act of civil disobedience, but they would also get together and do these role play where, you know, one person would act as the cop, the other would act as the activist, and then they would play out this scenario and the activists would learn how to basically not resist um, and how to not react in a violent manner. So you see a picture there, Martin Luther King uh, is a young man, it's 1957, and you can see he is giving a talk here at the Highlander Folk School. So this place becomes the seed bed for a lot of these early civil rights actions. And so I like to emphasize that because the civil rights movement was so powerful and so important in US history, it's important to acknowledge that this was not just a movement that spontaneously appeared out of nowhere. It had very strong leadership and it was very highly organized. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a landmark Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education, ruled on in 1954. So Oliver Brown was a World War II African American vet, and he came back from war um, to his home in Topeka, Kansas. And he had a family. He was able to get a house um, on his GI Bill. And he, um, as his daughter is growing up, um, you know, she is forced to attend the segregated school that is blocks away from his home instead of attending the white school, which is just a couple of blocks away. And so, you know, Oliver Brown thinks about this and he goes, you know what? I fought for this country. I put my life on the line for this country. And I don't think that my daughter should have to walk all the way across town to attend the segregated school. And so he decides that he is going to sue the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And this lawsuit then goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And it becomes a landmark case because with the NAACP's help, Oliver Brown will successfully be able to get a ruling in his favor that the segregation of public schools is unconstitutional based on the rights of African Americans as citizens under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So this um, case is a landmark case in that the Supreme Court of the United States, right, which is the ultimate authority on the Constitution, is saying that this uh, segregation law, the segregation of public schools is unconstitutional. And this will apply not only to Kansas, but it will apply to all states. So from Brown versus the board moving forward, 
segregation in public schools throughout the United States is illegal. And that is what is so important about this landmark case. Now, this does not end segregation generally. So other types of public places are still segregated after Brown versus the board. And in fact, there are still a lot of schools that remain segregated after Brown versus the board because there are a lot of areas of the country that are resistant to complying with this law. But it is illegal after um, Brown versus the board to have a segregated school in the United States. So very important um, victory here for the civil rights movement. And it does mark the beginning of the end for Jim Crow laws throughout the country, although that won't happen completely for another 10 years with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But this is the beginning. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a very seminal event in civil rights activism history and that is the Montgomery bus boycott. So here you see a very famous photograph. This is a photograph of uh, Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks was a seamstress working in Montgomery, Alabama, but she was also a part-time secretary for the local chapter of the NAACP. And she also happened to be a hardcore activist that had attended the Highlander Folk School. And she was chosen uh, by the activist networks to carry out this act of civil disobedience in December of 1955. Now, of course, what she famously does is she enters a public bus and she refuses to go to the back of the bus and she will be arrested and she will be fined uh, $14. But the important thing about um, Rosa Parks' action on that day is it starts a boycott of the Montgomery bus system. So Montgomery, Alabama relied upon um, the transportation services in that city relied upon the ridership of African Americans because African Americans would often have to take the bus from their home to work on a daily regular basis. And so a boycott by the African American community of the bus system of Montgomery, Alabama will really be a major blow to the industry. And there was a very um, little known preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, who is going to travel to Montgomery, Alabama to help organize this boycott. And that preacher's name, of course, was Martin Luther King. And he comes to Montgomery, Alabama, and he goes around to the African American churches and gives these very passionate speeches about how it is better to walk with dignity than to ride in humiliation. And he is urging people to honor this boycott of the bus system. The bus boycott will last an entire 13 months. Um, and eventually the Supreme Court of Alabama will desegregate, will rule to desegregate public transportation. So it becomes like a very successful act of civil disobedience here, beginning with this very courageous act by Rosa Parks um, in refusing to uh, walk to the back of the bus. And um, she actually lost her job, her seamstress job. So it wasn't like it wasn't without personal consequence for her, but she becomes the iconic symbol of this important act of civil disobedience, this 13 month boycott that will eventually lead to the desegregation of the public transportation systems um, in Alabama. So very important civil rights action and becomes um, 
known nationwide as well. It gets a lot of media coverage. This is when uh, Martin Luther King becomes a national figure is through the Montgomery bus boycott. So as I mentioned, the fact that this movement is really well organized becomes very critical, particularly during the bus boycott. Um, these are some photographs that were taken by Donald Cravens, the same Cravens from the Cravens building at um, COD. And um, Donald Cravens was a photographer for Life magazine, and he covered the Montgomery bus boycott. And this is one of his photographs of the taxi service that was organized by the activists um, to respond to the needs of people who were participating in the bus boycott. So as I mentioned, a lot of people, a lot of African Americans especially, had to rely upon the bus to get to and from work. And sometimes they had to travel miles. And so these taxis were really critical in helping people get from point A to point B um, throughout the duration of the boycott. And a lot of these people who were running these taxis were volunteering to do it because they believed in the cause. And this is a really great photograph that was taken again during the bus boycott. And here you have African-American woman probably been working all day. She's on her way home. She had to stop at the grocery store and here she is carrying things in both hands. She's got, you know, food on the top of her head and she is, and you just get this sense of pride and dignity that she is participating in this boycott and she doesn't seem bothered at all by the fact that she's you know burdened with having to walk probably miles and carry all of these things because ultimately this is going to be worth it and people and this boycott will prevail in desegregating the bus systems i just love this photograph i think it's so cool Okay, so now we're gonna turn our attention to another very important uh, civil rights action of the 1950s, and that's the actions of the Little Rock Nine in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. So Arkansas was one of those states um, that was very resistant to implementing the uh, requirements, the legal requirements of Brown versus the vo board. In fact, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Fabas, um, basically promised the, that the um, high schools of Little Rock, Arkansas would never um, be desegregated. And so the NAACP, again, activist organization, decides that it is going to solicit some um, student activists to volunteer to um, try to enroll at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so they reached out to African American high school students, um, made sure that many of these high school students were at the top of their class. So they were um, not students that could be accused of not, of not being good academically. Um, and they got them to volunteer. Now, obviously they probably had to have the permission of their parents for them to be able to do this as well. But they went and they registered them for classes over the summer in 1957. And then when fall came around in 1957, and these nine very brave uh, teenage activists show up to try to enter the high school they are prevented from entering the high school by the Arkansas National Guard and also groups of protesters that had gathered on the outskirts of the high school to also shout names at them and prevent them from entering the high school as well. And this happens day after day. So it happened on the first day of school. Um, and then a week later, um, you get the uh, president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, who reaches out to the governor and says, look, you have to let these kids 
go into the high school because it's against the law for you not to do that. And um, the governor still refuses and still continues to send out the guard to protect uh, or to stop the students from getting into the high school. So two weeks later, and again, um, Eisenhower was by no means a civil rights activist. Um, he wanted to remain as neutral as possible when it came to issues of civil rights. But the president was forced to get involved with this because it was coming becoming international news. So remember how I said that the international community was particularly influential when it comes to civil rights and the civil rights movement? That's because of the pressure that was being put on the U.S. government. And this gained so much media attention that you even have international media outlets who are covering this story. And it is quite a sight to see students denied access into a school simply because of the color of their skin. And so by the time we get to the end of September, school had been in, in um, had been going on for almost a month, the President of the United States, Eisenhower, will send in the National Guard and the U.S. Army to escort the students into school and bring them to their classes. And that is actually the photograph that you are seeing right here on the slide is those students very famously being escorted into class. So if you click on this YouTube link, um, you will uh, see an interview of one of these students and his experiences moving forward um, for the rest of the year. Sadly, ultimately, um, only one of these African-American students are actually going to graduate um, from a Central High School. Many of them will be driven out based on the way that they were treated by students um, and also teachers in the administration as well. But that doesn't take away from the fact that this act of civil disobedience was extremely influential because now you have a president of the United States who is now stepping up and supporting civil rights activists. And that becomes a very important um, symbol of strength moving forward for activists. Okay, so switching gears a little bit now, we're gonna talk about the election of 1960. So as I mentioned, um, Dwight Eisenhower will be the president for most of the 1950s. Um, and of course, he's going to step down after his second term. And for the Democrats, you are going to see this up and coming uh, senator, young senator from Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy and his running mate, Lyndon B. Johnson, a very popular Democratic uh, senator from Texas. Um, for the Republican Party, you are gonna have R Richard Nixon, who is a, a very seasoned politician. He had been the vice president. He had um, headed up Foreign Affairs Department. He was considered the favored candidate in this particular election of 1960, and he will choose as his running mate Henry Cabot Lodge, another senator from the state of Massachusetts. So um, as I mentioned, this was seen as a Nixon win by most of the political pundits at the time, but they did not factor in one very critical thing, and that is that this will be the first election that will be highly televised in a country that has televisions in almost every living room by the time we get to 1960. And so um, the first televised presidential debates will be held during the 1960 election. And there will be three of them all together. And it's the first one that really catches the attention of the nation. So you've got millions of viewers who are tuning in to this presidential debate. And Kennedy 
um, was so much better on camera than Richard Nixon. First off, Nixon refused to wear stage makeup, which is a horrible mistake if you're under bright lights on a stage. You're going to show um, perspiration and those types of things. So it's, it's very unforgiving, um, the camera. But in addition to that, Kennedy just had this very sort of youthful energy um, so that even though his responses to a lot of the questions during the debate were not as well articulated as um, Nixon's was, just based on his visual performance, he was able to sway a lot of voters in his direction. Nixon was much more uncomfortable on camera. He seemed very shifty. He didn't seem very um, tr uh, trustworthy on camera. So um, it's interesting, though, because the people that listened to this particular presidential debate on the radio thought that Nixon had done a better job. But again, it's this visual medium of the television that really allowed for Kennedy, this, this young senator, 43 years old, to really capture um, the energy of the nation at the time. And he, of course, will win this election. It will be a narrow win for Kennedy. Um, it will be the first election with all 50 states because Hawaii had recently become a state in 1959. And Kennedy will be elected as the first and only to date Catholic president. So here you see an image of the electoral map, um, and you'll notice that um, Kennedy uh, wins in, um, you know, so, some states. It's a very close, close uh, tie there. So if you look at the number of the electoral uh, votes, um, you see for Kennedy, 303, and for Nixon, 219. And then look how close uh, the popular vote is, is it's, it's very close. It's, it's a margin of about 100,000 here. So 34,200,000 and change for Kennedy, and then you've got 34,100,000 and change for Nixon. So um, very, very close there with the popular vote. All right, well, I'm going to do a brief bio sketch of John F. Kennedy because, you know, he wins the presidential election in 1960, takes office in 1961, and then is assassinated in 1963. So even though he is only president for a very short period of time, he was very influential during the time that he was in office, and he brought an energy to national politics that really had not been seen for, for quite some time. I mean, really probably going back to Theodore Roosevelt. So he's bringing this energy, this youthful energy into the presidential office. He was born in 1917 into a very wealthy Bostonian Irish Catholic family. His, his father was a man by the name of Joe Kennedy and his mother was uh, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. And um, the Kennedy family had won their fortunes through uh, banking, through stock investments, and also through bootlegging during uh, Prohibition. And, um, and so his father was a predominant banker. Um, he headed up the Security Exchange Commission and he was also an ambassador to Great Britain. So he definitely grew up in an environment of privilege. And you see there um, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, um, Kennedy's wife, and then his father right there, Joe Kennedy. Uh, Joe Kennedy was a very ambitious man. And they had um, uh, uh, Kennedy at JFK had nine siblings. He was the second oldest of the siblings. And his brother, his older brother, was really sort of the um, hope for the future of the family. Joe Kennedy made no qualms about the idea that he wanted to have one of his sons become president of the United States. And 
Um, and because um, the, you know, JFK was, and he was often referred to as Jack, was the, you know, younger brother, he, a lot of the pressure to, um, you know, to be successful was kind of lifted from his shoulders. And he was a little bit of a rebellious child. He was certainly very competitive and mischievous. Um, he went to Catholic schools growing up and he always uh, would say that he only liked two subjects and that was English and history. Um, and he was often sick as a child. So he stayed home a lot and was actually uh, received a lot of homeschooling as well. As I mentioned, he really did grow up in quite a lot of privilege and attended the Ivy League schools of both Princeton and Harvard in the late 1930s. He later admitted that he was almost completely unaware that the Great Depression was even taking place because he was so insulated from it uh, within his family. Um, he traveled to England with his dad, where his dad was an ambassador, and in 1940 he published a book on his senior thesis, which was titled Why England Slept, which was about why England was not prepared for Nazi Germany. During World War II, he actually joined the Navy and he served on a PT boat in the Pacific. In 1943, his PT boat was struck by a Japanese ship and he was wounded. Um, two other men actually died in this collision and um, they were ejected from the boat and Kennedy will help his boatmates to a shore where they were rescued six days later. So they're actually being marooned on this uh, um, island in the middle of the ocean for six days. Um, he eventually will earn medals for his bravery and a Purple Heart for his wounds for his service in World War II. In 1944, also during World War II, uh, Jack's older brother was shot down and killed. Um, and this was a huge blow to the family, but obviously now Jack was feeling very much pressured into going into politics in, to replace his brother. So in 1946, when he returns from his service in the military, he joins the House of Representatives um, for Massachusetts, um, but he was frustrated and he wanted to have a higher position. So in 1952, he challenges Henry Cabot Lodge for his Senate position in Massachusetts. And um, his own brother, Robert Kennedy, will serve as his campaign uh, manager, and it will be a very successful campaign. And he will actually win out over this old school um, senator. And he won and he will serve um, on the Senate for Massachusetts for eight years. In 1953, he met his wife, um, Jacqueline Kennedy, who you see pictured there, and they will have three children, Caroline, John, and Patrick. He, um, in 1957, wins a Pulitzer Prize for his biographical book, Profiles in Courage, where he talks about various people throughout history that he admires, and he writes about their lives and their accomplishments. He is the only president to win a Pulitzer Prize. In 1960, of course, he runs for president and he won by a very narrow margin. But again, he is a young president, just 43 years old. The only other president that will be as young as him will be Theodore Roosevelt at 42. So he's bringing this revitalization to American national politics. I recommend that you check out the YouTube link. This will lead you to more details about Kennedy, particularly his presidency and some of his accomplishments as president, which we will be talking about in the next lecture, but the video will give you even greater detail. All right, so that's all we got for today. Have a good one, guys, and I'll talk to you later.